Um, and those who are checking, recordings in progress. <laughs> uh, thank you for taking time out of your afternoon to be with us. Um, and thank you to Prairie Rivers of Iowa for the Pollinators People and Plants program we'll be enjoying. Um, I'm Melissa Lanfair, marketing manager here at Wheatsfield Co-op. And I'm just gonna go quickly through a little history behind the co-op, the cooperative movement and the program that brings us together today. Um, for those of you, most of you are probably familiar with the co-op, but Wheatsfield is a member owned natural foods grocery store lo uh, cooperative located in Ames. Uh, we were established in 1974 as a buyer's club by a group of people with similar desires in food quality and whole food availability. In August of 74, the desire to make whole and natural foods available to the public and to support healthy eating resulted in the formation and incorporation of the nonprofit entity known as the Mutual Aid Food Association, commonly known, uh, referred to as MAFA. And this was the first face of what is now it's so caught. Um, since then, we've grown from a 1,200 square foot store uh, renamed Wheatsfield Grocery at 413 uh, Douglas Avenue in the 80s to just under 20,000 total square feet after our uh, completion of our 2017 expansion project here at 413 Northwestern. And um, so some, I, I get the question a lot, what is a cooperative? So a co-op is a business run and operated by its members. Uh, co-op members, we refer to them as, or you as owners, member owners. Uh, we work towards a common goal of sharing in the profits and benefits of the business. Uh, the co-op business model is often applied to other businesses like farms, electrical, housing, banking, um, but almost any type of business can be a co-op. Um, I'm just gonna quick go through some cooperative principles. So cooperatives, around the world operate by the cooperative principles developed by the International Cooperative Alliance, um, revised in 1995. And they're based on the principles of the first modern co-op in Rochdale, England in 1884. Um, these seven principles are what keep us striving to improve the store, the local community and our environment. One is voluntary and open membership. Uh, everyone can be a member of the co-op. You do not need to be an owner or a member to shop. Everyone's welcome. Uh, two is democratic member control. Um, member owners at Wheatsfield vote on important issues like bylaws, uh, the yearly board election, and we all have equal voting rights. So one member, one vote. Three is member economic participation. We are all required to make a one-time fully refundable $100 investment, equity investment in the co-op. And this isn't, a, this is not a yearly fee. And uh, the more you shop at the co-op, the more benefits you get. Our fourth principle is autonomy and independence. Um, there is only one Wheatsfield co-op. While we cooperate with other co-ops, Wheatsfield has its own policies and is controlled by its members. Five is <clears throat> education, training, and information. Uh, Wheatsfield provides education and training for our members, directors, managers, employees, so we can contribute effectively to the development of the co-op. Six is cooperation among cooperatives. So by working with other co-ops, we uh, strengthen our co-op and the cooperative movement. And finally, seven is concern for community. We uh, seek to be a model of an environmentally aware, socially just, community-based business. We believe that it is, uh, that we have an active role to play in the local community in building thriving, sustainable relationships between members, the local community and the environment. And it's through our Change for Community donation program that we support local nonprofits with monthly donations. So by rounding up at the registers, donating extra change, we were able to make a direct positive impact in our community. A number for you, uh, in 2020, the program raised over $31,000 for local nonprofits. And while many of the organization, organizations supported through Change for Community are nonprofits, we also consider any organization that promotes natural or organic foods, nutrition, sustainability, and or environmental and community improvement. 
So our September change for community recipient is Perry Rivers of Iowa. And their mission is to promote economic development through the restoration and conservation of Iowa's cultural and natural resources. So we're very thankful to have their partnership in offering this program to us today. And so thank you again, everyone, for joining us tonight. I would like to introduce our speaker, David Stein. Uh, he's the Wat Watersheds and Wildlife Program Coordinator for Prairie Rivers of Iowa. Uh, he holds a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Science from Drake University, a Master's of Science in Ecology from Iowa State University. And he's passionate regarding conservation issues in Iowa and loves teaching others about the unique ecosystems found in the state. So thank you so much, David, and everyone involved, and welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me. So let me pull up my uh share screen uh oh, there we go okay so again this is uh pollinators plants and people and my name again is david stein i'm the watersheds and wildlife program coordinator at prairie rivers of iowa so just a little bit more about prairie rivers of iowa we are again a 501c3 not-for-profit uh, and we do work to conserve iowa's cultural and natural resources through our two main programs. Uh, the Lincoln Highway Heritage Byway is our main cultural resource program, and we manage the byway that stretches all across the state um, from river to river. And then we also uh, run the Watersheds and Wildlife Program, which is our main natural resource conservation program, uh, where we look at issues with water quality, pollution, uh, wildlife habitat, and restoration. So again, just who I am, uh, I'm the program coordinator again, for the Water Systems Wildlife Program. I have a Bachelor's of Science that I earned from Drake University back in 2013. Uh, and then I got my Master's in Ecology from ISU in 2017. And combined with everything, I have around seven years of experience with both prairie and pollinator conservation. So we're gonna start with a brief pollinator overview. Uh, we're gonna learn about what they are, where they live, and some of the troubles that they're going through. So we'll talk a little bit first about what they evolved alongside. So we'll talk about Iowa's natural history. So pre-settlement Iowa looked a little bit like this. Uh, in the yellow were the original tall grass prairies, and in the green were the original forest cover, which were pretty limited to uh, the northeastern part of the state and along the rivers. Um, but the vast majority of our state was covered in prairie. And it had a couple of uh, wetlands and rivers in the blue that you can see dotting the landscape. Uh, so in those prairies, we had a lot of grasses. We had definitely a, lot, a large amount of wildflowers that our pollinators can use to thrive on. However, post-settlement, our landscape now looks a little bit like this. So uh, replaced by uh, the vast majority of the land uh, covered in row crop agriculture like corn and soybeans, um, and then also cities dotting the landscape as well. You could see the vast majority of our prairie uh, is gone. I think around 0.1% or less now exists in the state, limiting where pollinators can actually thrive. So with that shift in land management, we've also lost quite a bit of wildlife. So pollinators are no exception. Uh, lots of our butterfly species have either been extirpated from central Iowa and moved to different parts of the states, state or have left the state entirely. Uh, birds as well, uh, greater prairie chickens and a lot of shorebirds have left the central part of Iowa for uh, different areas of the state and different states. And then mammals were the largest or hardest hit. So we had bison, we had wolves, we had porcupines, we had elk, but they have since uh, left the state of Iowa since we have transformed the state from a prairie covered state into more of a farm field covered state. But we also do have leftover wildlife that does need help. Uh, the majority of them are pollinators. So a lot of our bumblebees and a lot of our butterflies are in dire need of habitat restoration and uh, reintroduction. But we also have birds that are in need, mammals that are in need, and uh, amphibians and reptiles that are also in need. But by focusing on pollinators, uh, we can help restore the ecosystem that support the rest of those species in peril. So that's what our talk today is going to be about. So first, we have to decide what a pollinator is. So a pollinator, just very briefly, is an animal that moves pollen from one flower to another. And it's usually almost by accident. Those animals are either trying to drink the nectar or trying to eat the pollen. Um, and a few grains of pollen will fall off that animal 
uh, as it moves from flower to flower, and that'll help start the seed producing process in the plant. So the ones that we usually think of as pollinators would be things like bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds. So the bees are going to eat pollen and eat nectar, uh, and they're also gonna collect the pollen. So they're usually gonna be the most efficient. Uh, butterflies will really only be drinking nectar, and they'll accidentally move pollen that might be on their mouth parts that they move from one flower to another, and the same with uh, the hummingbird. But those aren't the only pollinators. We also have things like beetles, wasps, moths, and flies. And all of these have their own nut uh, nutritional needs, and each of them has their own habitat needs and their own flower needs as well. And we'll talk a little bit about each of these as they come uh, into be a little more relevant. So why do we need a plant for pollinators? Uh, well, they are facing a multitude of threats here in Iowa. The three main ones are going to be pathogens or diseases and fungi and uh, parasites, uh, pesticides uh, that you usually see on either lawns or on uh, row crop agriculture, and then habitat loss, uh, which is probably the main driver here in central Iowa uh, as we tore up the prairie and replaced it with farmland. Uh, but we have a lot of opportunities to actually get conservation on the ground. We have around 400 different species of bee and over 100 species of butterfly. So there are quite a few species that we can protect here in the state. Uh, again, the most uh, dire issue here in central Iowa is the loss of habitat uh, in favor of farmland. So we have uh, some evidence as to why pollinators are declining and how they're declining here in Iowa. So 2014 was a big watershed year for pollinators in the state. Uh, two species were listed as either threatened or endangered. Those were the Dakota skipper last seen in 1980 and the Pauschik skipperling last seen in 2007. Um, but we also have uh, the rusty patch bumblebee which was listed as endangered in 2017. Uh, the monarch butterfly, which was denied Endangered Species Act protections, but listed as a candidate species uh, due to its population continually falling uh, from 1994, uh, when we started taking uh, this problem a little more seriously. And then in 2021, even managed pollinators like honeybees have started declining. Uh, Iowa in the last year had the highest rate of winter honeybee colony loss out of anywhere in the United States. Uh, at a rate of 58.4%. So that means 58.4% of all honeybee colonies in the state died uh, as a result of this last winter. Um, this trend continued throughout the entire year. Um, an annual loss in 2020, I believe, was around 75%. So not only are wild pollinators suffering, uh, our managed pollinators like honeybees are suffering as well. So the easiest way to uh, make our pollinators a little bit more healthy or give them a little place to grow would be to connect them with plants. Um, so pollinators and plants have a very, very close relationship. Uh, pollinators use plants for a variety of reasons. These could be food, uh, including nectar and pollen, shelter. A lot of pollinators will uh, use stems of plants or leaves of plants or even twigs of plants to actually make their nests. Uh, building materials, some pollinators will build their nests out of plant materials or derive building materials out of resins or waxes uh, or things like that. And then nurseries for young. A lot of pollinators will use uh, different specific species of plants to lay their eggs in order to have their young grow. This is usually found in moths and butterflies. And in turn, pollinator, or, uh, plants use pollinators for their own needs. Again, pollen needs to be delivered from one plant to another to start the fruit and seed production process, which in turn makes the next generation of plants. Uh, the majority of our flowering plants here in Iowa are dependent on insects or pollinators to spread that pollen, uh, either butterflies or bees. Um, and so that relationship is really, really closely aligned and symbiotic between the two. So the main reason that pollinators use plants is for food. Um, pollinators get their name from pollen, which they derive or which they eat. So pollinators will forage for both pollen, which are those plant reproductive cells, as well as nectar, which is really produced by the plant as either a reward for pollinating or as a lure to lure in these pollinators to get them to bring their pollen from one plant to another. So different pollinators have their own unique nutritional needs. Uh, butterflies and moths really only need nectar. Uh, as they fly, they expend a lot of energy 
And that nectar, which is essentially sugar water, is then essentially carboloid. It's then getting either a protein shake or a, an energy drink to help them fly from one place to another over long distances. However, bees need a more complete meal of pollen and nectar. Uh, they need the protein that they derive from that pollen, not only to feed themselves, but to feed their young. And they also need the carbohydrates, the sugars from the nectar as well. So various uh, diets exist for various pollinators, and it really just depends on their life cycle and their needs. So another re reason that pollinators need plants is in order to take care of the young. So for bees and wasps, pl uh, plants play a really crucial role in nesting. Uh, there are many nesting strategies. Uh, even in ground nesting plants, uh, those cavities are gonna be lined with waxes that the pollinators will derive from uh, different plant sources. Uh, they might also nest in wood. Uh, these are the cases for carpenter bees, which you might see in your fence every year. Uh, they might nest in twigs uh, or dead stems. Uh, this is really popular with mason bees uh, and leaf cutter bees, or they might be colonial. Uh, these would be things like wasps, like bees, where they derive, again, those waxes from different plant sources. So the parents will really provide a space for those kids, and they will provide the pollen for them to grow. Butterflies, on the other hand, have a very hands-off approach, but it's still linked to plants. So those butterflies will choose a plant that they call a host plant. Uh, they'll lay an egg and then they'll leave. Uh, kind of say good luck to the kids, they're on their own and they'll go out and lay more eggs under their plants. Uh, in turn, those caterpillars will eat those plants, incorporate some chemical defenses that the plant provides to make them toxic throughout their development as larvae, as cocoons and as adults. So a little bit more about host plants. Uh, these, again, are those nurseries for butterflies. Uh, they act as sort of a source of food and a source of protection. So the caterpillar will eat the plant. They'll incorporate, again, those chemical defenses that the plant produces into their own bodies and use them for defense as larvae and as adults. Uh, the most famous example of this are milkweeds and monarchs. So a monarch will lay its egg on a various milkweed, uh, regardless of the species. Uh, that caterpillar will eat the plant. It will eat those leaves as it develops. Uh, it will eat quite a few leaves. Uh, it'll incorporate those waxy, uh, latexy uh, poisons that the plant uh, produces into its own body and develop into a butterfly uh, that's also poisonous to eat. The same thing can be seen for literally every other butterfly species. Uh, just another couple examples are prairie violets and regal fritillaries. Again, that butterfly will lay an egg on a violet. The caterpillar will eat the violet and incorporate the chemical defenses to make it uh, poisonous as a caterpillar and an adult, and the uh, cycle will repeat itself. The same thing happens with pawpaws and zebra swallowtails, as well as white turtlehead and Baltimore checker spots. Um, every species of caterpillar does this. Every species of caterpillar has its own host plant uh, that it will rely on. Uh, these can range from small flowers all the way up to large oak trees. Um, but it's a cycle and an evolutionary advantage that pollinators have had uh, developing over millions of years. On the other hand, uh, different plants have specialized for different pollinators. Uh, for example, on the left, we have the bottle gentian, which is actually blooming right now. Uh, this has developed a closed uh, system for a flower and it relies on bumblebees as the most efficient pollinator, uh, not only for them, but as the prairie uh, as a whole. And uh, it relies on those large kind of buff bees to break open that flower and gather as much pollen and nectar as they can. Um, they will only be able to be opened by large bumblebees or carpenter bees. Um, and that's really their most efficient way to get pollen from one flower to another. Uh, the same thing is with uh, camouflage. So, uh, plants have evolved around, alongside pollinators and vice versa in order to hide uh, against predators or have predators hide amongst them to get rid of any pests. So now we're going to talk a little bit more about actually planting for pollinators or how we can create habitat for them at home. So the main recommendations uh, that I like to start out with is really just to plant a lot of flowers of different species. Uh, use mainly native flowers. Uh, Rethink your lawn a little bit and don't use any invasive species. So 
really deciding which plants are right for you really depends on the space that you have. So like all other living things, uh, native plants have their own requirements. So a couple of things to keep in mind would be things like soil moisture. Uh, some plants like really wet mud or saturated zones and wet roots. Other plants like dry areas. So knowing what types of soils you have on your land is important to decide what is right for your land. Uh, the same thing with sunlight. Uh, prairie and woodland species are very different. They have different uh, sunlight requirements. Some plants need uh, shade from different trees. Some plants don't need shade at all and will only thrive in very sunny zones. So knowing what you can provide those plants is your best first step to deciding what to put on the landscape. Additionally, uh, researching the previous land cover will be important to decide what you can put on the landscape. Uh, if your original land cover was in prairie, uh, installing a wetland or installing a forest might not work out great for you, and vice versa. If your uh, land was once a wetland and it has very wet soils, you're not going to want to put things that rely on dry, sandy sites. Uh, or if you had a prairie, you might not want to put in a lot of uh, shady woodland species. Uh, so knowing what was on the landscape before uh, will really benefit you in the long run. And even looking at the current land covers, uh, how you're going to work around trees or buildings or roads or anything that comes off of uh, those uh, current land covers. So knowing what shade is going to be there, knowing where water is going to flow after it rains, knowing uh, if there's going to be any trash thrown from roads or any uh, debris or pollution. Those would be really good things to know when you decide which plants are right for you. Uh, but above all else, just planting native is gonna be great. Speaking of which, uh, how to plant native is actually very easy for the state of Iowa. Like we talked about before, nearly all of the state is in the tall grass prairie ecoregion. This gives you a very uh, diverse list of plants to choose from. Uh, and as long as you don't stay away from that list of plants, you should be all set to go. Uh, you're not going to want to bring in anything that's from really down southeast or southwest or really far out west. Really just sticking within those prairie plants uh, or that tall grass prairie ecoregion in the central part of the U.S. is going to be your best bet. Um, there's a lot of diversity, a lot of different colors, a lot of different bloom times, and it's really up to your imagination and your preferences on where you go. Uh, on top of that, many of the flowering plants that you do want to promote in your yard are going to be very hardy and easy to grow throughout Iowa's wacky weather throughout the year. So really those are going to be your best bet to put on the landscape. We also have uh, evidence showing that more native pollinators will stop by a landscape if there are more native plants. And this makes sense from an evolution perspective. These are the plants they evolved alongside for millions of years. This is what they're used to. And this is really what provides them with the best nutrition and the best uh, quantities of pollen and nectar that they need to grow and produce the next generation of pollinators. And finally, if you can avoid cultivars, uh, cultivars are specifically bred to expend energy not in producing nectar or pollen, but into producing either larger flowers or new pigments or more flowers or a larger shape or size, um, rather than providing those nutritional benefits to pollinators. So if you can avoid them, uh, that's the best course of action. Also taking a look at bloom time. So different species are going to be blooming at different times of the year. Not everything blooms at once, as I'm sure everyone's aware of, um, but they all have their own niche and they all have their own pollinators that, it, that they associate with. Pollinators are going to be active all season uh, from early March all the way to early November. So having plant communities blooming all throughout that season is going to be incredibly important to get the most pollinators, the most nutritional benefits. So different plant communities are going to be different uh, blooming based on time. So you're not going to have the same species of plants blooming uh, early in the year as you will at the later end of the year. Think you're not going to have sunflowers blooming in March and you're not going to have uh, columbine blooming in November. Uh, so kind of maximizing the benefits and maximizing the amount that are blooming at different times is going to be great. Uh, a way that I like to kind of go around this is using the holiday system. So having a certain set of plants blooming on each of these different days is going to be great. So having a couple plants bloom on Memorial Day, say like this uh, wild indigo, 
having a couple plants bloom around Independence Day, like this wild bergamot, and then finally having plants bloom around Labor Day uh, and beyond, like this golden rod. So just a couple examples of this, uh, kind of outside that uh, holiday system, uh, this is where trees usually fall in. These are usually going to be the most uh, beneficial for those early, early uh, emerging bees, like queen bumblebees. Uh, the fruit producing trees are going to be very uh, important for collecting pollen and nectar. These would include things like red buds, plums, crab apples, willows, et cetera. Uh, these are going to be blooming around early March, early April. However, the early season blooms that start around Memorial Day would be things like prairie lousewort, which blooms in uh, sort of shady savanna sites, red columbine, which can bloom either in prairies or woodlands, wild lupine, uh, wild indigo, things like that. Mid-season blooms will really maximize around Independence Day, so that June, July, early August period. These would be your coneflowers, your milkweeds, bee balm, uh, all sorts of other different native mints. These are really going to be uh, popping around that Independence Day uh, time of year. And then finally, the late season blooms, just a couple examples would be things like partridge pea, uh, the asters, and then the blazing stars and iron weeds. Um, so just having a couple plants of each bloom time uh, on your landscape is really going to get you the highest pollinator benefit, and it's going to look nice throughout the year. Finally, uh, I'd like to talk about the lawn. So here in central Iowa, the lawn kind of uh, reigns supreme, uh, at least in the city of Ames and down in the Des Moines metro. Um, I'd like to say that grass is great. Uh, they use, uh, pollinators will use grass for both food and shelter. The picture here, you can see a honeybee actually feeding on pollen from grass flowers. Uh, this is a corn, which is a type of grass. Um, however, uh, when you do only have one type of grass uh, throughout an entire piece of land, like a lawn, and you're keeping it short and you're not allowing it to bloom uh, or produce seeds or produce nectar or pollen, um, you're really reducing a lot of these benefits. Uh, another thing about uh, lawns is they do not support a really climate change uh, promotional benefit. The roots are very short. They're not storing a lot of carbon as opposed to our native grasses, which have very deep root systems and do store a lot of organic carbon in the soil, uh, giving us a little bit of carbon sequestration benefits. Uh, also about the lawn, they, are, they do get expensive and time consuming. Uh, just think to yourself, would it be nice if you spent a little less money on gas for your lawnmower or blades for your lawnmower or even time on the weekends mowing your lawn? And instead you had a uh, wide array of benefits for wildlife and uh, pollinators and carbon storage. So a couple of alternatives that we can talk about is reducing the actual cover of turf uh, slowly over time, either through native landscaping or gardening or things like that. So the lawn is a very outdated concept. It was thought up in uh, the 1700s and 1800s as a way of showing off how rich you were with how much land you cannot use to produce food. Uh, it's really just having a large area not devoted to producing anything was a hot topic for the aristocracy back then. It's a very outdated concept and it really uh, doesn't have too much of a place here uh, in the modern world. So just a couple of alternatives that we can provide uh, to lawns that might have other benefits. Uh, clover lawns are getting to be a little bit more popular. You might also know them as bee lawns or pollinator lawns. Uh, this person on the left went all out and replaced the entire uh, the entirety of their turf with clover varieties. Uh, as they mature and as they grow, they will start producing flowers. Uh, those flowers are very rich in nectar, uh, which help our native pollinators grow and uh, mature and produce the next generation. Uh, you don't have to go all out with clover lawns. Uh, people do like to intercede with clover uh, in their regular bluegrass lawns, or you might want to intercede with uh, a mix of clover and other legumes. The alternative here would be uh, using something like buffalo grass or native landscapes. So completely replacing your lawn with either a native grass variety or a prairie uh, for us here in Iowa. And there are multiple benefits that come from that. So those native prairies will have much deeper roots. Uh, these will be very hardy plants that can survive droughts. 
uh, by getting a lot of water from the ground with those deep roots. Uh, and they can also increase the permeability of your land. So if you have a problem with flooding or ponding of water after a large rain event, uh, these can create more porous soils or more holes in the soil to actually hold that water in place. And on top of that, with these root systems that are very thick and very web-like and stretch down uh, 15, 20 feet, they store a lot of organic carbon. So uh, you can be doing your part in sequestering carbon from the atmosphere and mitigating climate change uh, as you can on your own land. So another alternative to uh, just regular old turf grass. But if you are unwilling to make your lawn uh, into more of a native landscape, there are other benefits that you can get by just changing around the way that you take care of your lawn. Uh, the most important of which is mulching instead of raking. So if you do have trees that do have leaves that fall every year, uh, do the responsible wildlife thing and don't rake them as they fall. Uh, fall leaves are incredibly important throughout the season or throughout the winter. Uh, for a variety of different benefits. Uh, there are lots of organizations taking uh, steps to get the word out about this. Uh, leaves are good shelter and hibernation areas for amphibians, reptiles, mammals, uh, pollinators, insects, etc. So they provide a lot of different benefits. Um, if you leave your leaves and then mulch them later on in the year, uh, we usually like to promote around uh, early May. Uh, if you mulch them with either a a uh, push mower or a riding mower, uh, really just chopping them up, they can act as a natural fertilizer for your lawn. Uh, those fallen leaves are packed with nutrients that the tree uh, took from the soil and from the air, and you can redistribute those around your lawn, giving you a nice greener area uh, that'll look a lot better. But some other examples of people doing this, this is a pollinator habitat that people piled up leaves around just to provide more of a habitat for hibernation for a lot of our native bees. And then you might be able to see leaves of little guys as well. Uh, salamanders will use wet uh, leaves during the winter to hide themselves in uh, and survive over the cold season. So a couple plants not to consider. These are really going to be your invasives. Uh, just a list of a couple that uh, are a rather large problem here in central Iowa would be things like birch with trefoil, uh, wild parsnip, which is not only uh, bad for wildlife, but bad for us as well. Uh, it causes a lot of burns. Buckthorn, uh, which is really distributed by birds through a lot of different berries that it produces, and they kind of sprout up here and there just based on where the birds are flying. Garlic mustard, Tartarian honeysuckle, Chinese lespedeza, and calorie or Bradford pear. Uh, you should avoid these at all costs, and if you have them in your, art, in your yard, consider uh, either chopping them down or controlling them as best as you can, uh, making sure that they don't go to seed and uh, they aren't spread either through birds or through uh, distribution by wind. So again, just repeating those recommendations. Uh, if you have an area to actually plant into wildflowers or plant into gardens, make sure that you plant a lot of different flowers of different species. Uh, make sure that they have different sizes and shapes to accommodate both butterflies and bees. Make sure that they have different colors to attract different species and make sure that they have different bloom times that you get the most benefits for pollinators uh, and for your garden throughout the entire year. Make sure that you use native plants. Uh, native pollinators have evolved alongside these for millions of years. This is what they're used to and this is what provides them with the highest uh, bit of nutrition that they can use uh, later on. A little effort goes a long way, so make sure that you consult either with a master gardener or a guidebook to native plants so that you actually do incorporate bees onto your landscape. And finally, break the mold and rethink your lawn. Uh, if anything, use a non-monoculture lawn mix. Uh, incorporate more legumes, more clovers, more ground ivy, more flowering plants like dandelions into your actual yard, uh, or get rid of your lawn entirely. Uh, replace it with native landscaping or a series of gardens or something that provides a little bit more benefit uh, for both pollinators and for people uh, as opposed to just a regular old turf lawn. So now that, we're, uh, now that we've discussed how pollinators use plants and how pollinators affect plants and plants affect pollinators and vice versa, we're going to talk a little bit about plants that link people and pollinators. And the best Do we want to take a break for questions? 
Oh, uh, we can certainly. Um, I and mean, we can also, um, if you have questions, feel free to type them in the chat and I can uh, relay them to David at the end of the presentation. But yeah, we can. Or if you have a question now, uh, feel free to unmute your microphone. Well, I guess I could have a question for you. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I live in Ames and I mean, I think I know the answer, but um, what would Ames be like the previous land cover for Ames be considered? So the majority of Ames was covered in tall grass prairie. The only exception of this would be if you're by a river. So if you're by a river or within the floodplain of that river, chances are it's either going to be more of a woodland or forest or a savanna. So there are maps that you can consult um, that show exactly what that land cover was. They're a little, uh, they're a little vague at, at times, but uh, if you're interested in knowing what your land previously was, uh, let us know and we can do it for you and we can let you know and uh, get you a list of plants that'll work. Uh, David, we have a uh, request to see the uh, slide of invasive species to avoid. Yes. So I again, know one of those that looks familiar, My, uh, I think my neighbors have a, a hedge of tartarian honeysuckle. Unfortunately, I don't think I can, well, maybe I could talk to them about removing it, but. Uh, Yep, the Tartarian honeysuckle has been a problem in Iowa for many, many years. Uh, I believe it was one of those that was brought over as both an ornamental and for erosion control, and it got out of hand. Um, same thing with that and uh, buckthorn as well. Uh, again, erosion control was great. Um, people didn't really know how to do it with natives at the time, uh, back in the early uh, 1900s, so they brought over ones that were used in Europe and Asia. Uh, and they just went crazy. Um, but we're always getting new invasives. Uh, the Chinese lesbidiza or the Chinese bush clover is a new addition uh, that showed up in the last 20 years. And the Bradford pear was popular in landscaping, but it's really uh, become a problem here in Iowa and down in Missouri as well. Um, so uh, these are the ones to avoid just uh, as an introductory level. Uh, but there are plenty more, uh, not necessarily within the city of Ames, but throughout the entire state of Iowa and the Midwest as well. So uh, if you're at all concerned about what might be invasive, uh, ask either a master gardener or us and we can help you out. Um, yeah, no more uh, questions in the chat. Um, so I guess we could continue on. Yeah, so we're gonna finish up with our last uh, section here. So we're gonna to try to connect plants that link people and pollinators. And the best way that I went around trying to figure this out is by talking about foraging. So just a brief introduction to foraging. Uh, it's really the definition of local food. It's going out into nature or into a park or a piece of land that hasn't been developed uh, or has been restored back into natives and collecting food uh, from wild sources. So this has been going on here in Iowa for millennia. And as a result of that, we know of several edible plants in Iowa that can accomplish a wide variety of needs. So these can include things like fruits, like vegetables, grains, herbs, and spices, uh, different herbal teas, roots, tubers, pods, really anything uh, that you have on your plate that's a vegetable or that comes from a plant source uh, chances are there is a native source here in Iowa uh, that you can uh, use to replace it. Uh, however, something that you need to keep in mind, again, just like our flowers, seasonality is key. So you're not going to find these, uh, all of these different uh, edible plants during every trip that you take out into the woods or out into the prairie. Uh, so knowing when things are out, knowing when things bloom is really your uh, best bet to getting uh, the most amount of your foraging time. Uh, something that we do like to keep in mind is to be ethical about when you forage and how you forage. Really, the good rule of thumb is only taking what you need. Uh, since foraging oftentimes requires you to take an entire plant, that's one less plant that's out on the landscape for other people and for wildlife. So really keeping in mind that there are other people and other animals and other beings using this stuff 
um, it really uh, helps maintain more of an ethical standpoint. Uh, a good way around this is to use uh, uh, different recipes that you're gonna be using some of these plants on. So say you, are, you have a recipe that calls for two or three uh, wild onions. Uh, that's not an excuse to go out and fill a garbage bag full of wild onions. Just take what you need. Um, and if you need more, you can always go back later. And also be mindful of wildlife, especially with the fruits and with the grains. A lot of those wildlife are going to be needing those, uh, getting ready for winter and getting ready for hibernation. So again, only take what you need. Um, if a recipe only calls for two cups, only take two cups. If a recipe calls for uh, anything less than that, only take anything less than that. Don't fill up multiple bags full of this stuff uh, and leave nothing else for wildlife. Invasive species, of course, are an exception. Uh, if you see garlic mustard, feel free to pull as much as you want. Uh, that stuff is not supposed to be here. It serves no environmental or ecological purpose here in Iowa. So if you want to eat invasive species, go right ahead. Um, another important thing to do is to not eat anything that you are either unfamiliar with or anything that's not ripe. A lot of unripened fruits, uh, especially things like may apples and choke cherries are poisonous when they are not ripe. Uh, so avoid those. Um, and then also, if you're really unfamiliar with plants, if you aren't 100% sure of what a plant is, uh, get either a master gardener or a botanist or us to confirm uh, if that fruit is, uh, or if that wild food is actually edible. So I'm just gonna go over a couple of common examples of foraged food here in Iowa. And we're gonna go over their benefits to both people and uh, to pollinators. So the first one that usually shows up in the year, early spring, are ramps. So this is a wild member of the onion family. Uh, it's also known as wild leek, spring onion, or shikakwa. Uh, it can usually be found in rich and wet forests. Uh, this isn't a prairie species. This is more of a floodplain, bottomland forest species. Uh, it has a very strong, sweet garlic and onion flavor, as you would expect from a wild member of the onion family. Um, this is actually the origin of the Skunk River and how it got its name. Uh, it just comes from a mid, uh, mistranslation of the word Shishakwa. Uh, someone wanted to uh, say that the river was named after something that smelled really strongly. Uh, the translator took this as it being skunk, but it actually was from those wild leeks that smelled strongly of onions throughout the early season. Uh, this is how this is also how Chaco Bottoms Greenbelt in Polk County got its name and how the city of Chicago got its name. Uh, this plant is pollinated by native small bees and hoverflies. Uh, the flowers are very small, uh, but they do produce a lot of pollen and nectar for these uh, pollinators in a year. Um, and this plant will only flower after the leaves have gone dormant and after the stem has died back for the year. So this is another reason to practice those uh, ethical foraging skills and leaving some plants in place. The next one that blooms in the year is going to be service berry uh, or the Amank or the Amel Lank here species. Uh, these are also known as June berries or Saskatoons, depending on the species. This is one of the earliest flowering uh, fruits here in the state of Iowa. Uh, Quick question uh, on ramps. Um, yeah. uh, Cynthia uh, said, I bought ramps at Wheatsfield, but didn't know it grows around Ames. Uh, where would you find it? Yep, so these do grow around Ames. Uh, really, you're gonna find them along rivers in wet forests. So just a couple of parks that are around those wet rivers and forests would be things like Moore Memorial, if you get off the, the beaten path. Uh, Reactor Woods might have them. Munn Woods would most likely have them. Uh, Skunk River Flats. Uh, Chichaco Bottoms Greenbelt, if you want to go a little bit further into Polk County, um, and Janet Heritage area around uh, or south of Nevada might have them as well. Really anywhere that's a wet forest, you're bound to see them during the, the early part of the year. Ledges too, I think I've seen ramps. Yep, ledges would also be one. Since it's right by the river and has those wet woods, um, that would be a good place to go foraging as well. So again, going back to service berry, this is one of the earliest blooming uh, fruiting trees that we have here in Iowa. Uh, most often you'll see these as ornamentals. Uh, people will buy them in uh, garden stores, but you can usually find them, find them in smaller numbers in upper dry forests. 
uh, upland forests, things like oak and hickory forests would be a good place to see them. Uh, the berries are eaten whole. Uh, I describe them as having a mild, like a milder blueberry flavor uh, with really soft seeds that taste almost like almonds. So if you're interested to see what a blueberry mixed with an almond might taste like, this might be the fruit for you. Uh, it's one of the earliest fruiting trees as well, uh, giving them the name Juneberry. They do ripen up around June. Uh, this is really going to be valuable to birds and mammals later on in the year. Uh, they like to eat the drier, uh, more ripe fruit that either falls from the tree or sticks around until winter. So leave some in place for them. These are going to be pollinated by early native bees, like mining bees. And it's a host plant for a couple butterfly species, including the striped hair streak and red spotted purple. Uh, since it's in the rose family, it does have a lot of cyanide in it. So with those host plants uh, feeding the caterpillars, they're going to incorporate that cyanide into their bodies uh, for later use. Wild bergamot is a summer blooming herb. Uh, this is also known as bee balm or horse mint or wild oregano. Uh, it's a really hardy plant found in most prairies. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's a wet prairie, a dry prairie, or somewhere in between. Chances are you're probably going to find wild bergamot. Uh, you can really tell them apart by their fluffy lavender uh, flowering heads. Uh, all above ground parts of the plant are edible, but the stem can get very chewy and woody. So uh, exercise caution there. I would only recommend uh, foraging for the leaves, uh, the young shoots and the flowers. Uh, the taste I would describe as somewhere in between mint, oregano, basil and thyme. Uh, this makes for a very good dried herb or in a very good tea. Um, I usually use it in pesto as well. Uh, just replace basil with uh, bee balm and still use walnuts and oil and Parmesan cheese and you have a great pesto. Uh, it produces a ton of nectar throughout the season. Uh, this is something known as a honey plant. So a lot of beekeepers will actually plant this around their yards to make sure that their honeybees are getting a large amount of nectar throughout the year. Um, and since it produces so much nectar, we have a ton of pollinators visit it things like sweat bees, uh, butterflies like skippers, and even hummingbirds will go ahead and feed off of it. Black raspberry will usually ripen up the first couple weeks of July. Uh, this is also called black cap or scotch cap raspberry. Again, this is gonna be found in upland woodlands, uh, savannas and woodland borders. Uh, the berries are gonna be edible when ripe and the leaves can be made into a tea. Uh, again, the taste is not too far off from a red raspberry. They're a little less juicy and a little less sweet, but they have more of a complex and bold raspberry essence or flavor. Again, this is gonna be incredibly important later food for birds and mammals as they get ready to uh, hibernate. Um, they will eat the fruits that fall off of the plant or that dry out on the plant or go through that frost. And they will use that to get ready for hibernation or to just eat when they're ripe. Uh, these are again, pollinated by bees, uh, most, uh, famously, they're pollinated by orchard bees or osmia bees that you'll see out at different orchard productions. Uh, they're very, very uh, efficient pollinators since they can carry a ton of pollen. And it's also another host to the striped hair tree. Again, since it's in the rose family, it has uh, cyanide-based uh, chemicals that it incorporates into its body. Common milkweed is usually a surprising one that a lot of people don't know that they can eat. Uh, this is found pretty much everywhere. Uh, you can see it in most prairies, uh, roadsides, old fields, forest edges, might be in your yard, uh, might be in a cornfield, but it is edible. Uh, when it's young, the shoots can be uh, boiled, the flowers can be boiled, the pods can be boiled, as long as they're young um, and as long as you cook. Uh, the taste is very similar to asparagus, uh, but as long as you cook them, every part of the plant is edible. Uh, these are visited by native bees and butterflies, uh, moths and flies. Again, this is another nectar plant, produces a lot of nectar for bees and helps them survive throughout the year. And famously, this is the host plant of the monarch. So if you plant these for eat, either eating fruits or flowers or pods uh, or the stalks, you're helping the monarch uh, during its growth and migration. American plum is blooming around now or ripening around now. Uh, this is also called wild plum or yellow sweet plum. Uh, it's usually going to be found in savannas and woodland edges. Uh, this is a very, very common plant, uh, mainly from its dispersers. Uh, these are going to be large mammals like foxes. They will actually eat the entire fruit, 
uh, carry the seeds in their stomach and disperse them as they go to the bathroom. So if you see a thicket, a thicket of it and then a couple of trees further down the line, chances are a fox came through, ate it and had a good time. Uh, they taste very sweet and very floral. Uh, however, the skins are really tart and astringent. So if you're not uh, into a really sour type of fruit that contrasts with sweet, this might not be for you, or you might wanna process it into uh, either a jelly or a jam or fruit leather. Uh, again, the fruit is very important to native mammals like foxes, and these are gonna be pollinated by uh, native bees. And it's been shown that the rusty patch bumblebee the very, very critically endangered bee that's native to Ames loves feeding on uh, cherries and plums and things in this family. Again, uh, since it is in the rose family, it does have cyanide in it. So make sure that you're not eating fruits when they're not ripe. Choke cherry is the other edible native prunus or native cherry. Uh, we also have black cherry, but uh, it's very hard to find. Um, and especially hard to get to since they're very tall trees. So this is the only other one that I'm gonna be talking about. Again, they ripen around now. It's also called bit, uh, bitter berry or Virginia bird cherry since they're dispersed by birds. Uh, again, these are, all, these are often found in woodlands and savannas, uh, really dry upland areas. The fruits are only edible when ripe and only the fruits. Make sure that you get rid of all pits and all twigs and all stems since again, they do contain cyanide. Uh, these are going to be very sour and very astringent, uh, which really has people leave them out to blet, which is getting a frost coming through and have them sort of rot a little bit. Uh, they'll also let them dry or they'll sweeten them with sugar in a jam or a jelly to make them actually edible. Um, really getting them as ripe as possible will make them the most edible. But since they do produce a lot of fruit, uh, for indigenous cultures here in Iowa, this was a very, very staple crop since it produced a ton of fruit and provided a ton of natural fibers and sugars um, as, a, as a regular crop. Again, these are pollinated by smaller native bees like sweat bees. And again, since it does contain cyanide, it does have host plant or host butterflies uh, as the red spotted purple and coral industry. Pawpaw again is also blooming right around now. It's also called prairie banana. Uh, this is found in really high quality bottomland forests. Here in Iowa, it is an endangered species, uh, so they are incredibly rare, uh, but you can take the fruits as long as they are off the plant. Uh, these fruits are edible when ripe and they taste extremely tropical, like a mix between mango, pineapple, banana, melon, guava, passion fruit, kind of all the tropical flavors mixed into one. Um, this is an interesting plant. It's an, it's an ecological remnant from the ice age. It used to rely on large mammals like brown sloths and mammoths and glyptodonts and large camel relatives to eat the actual fruit and disperse the seeds. But now it's kind of up to us since we're the, really the only one that can actually do it. Uh, also interesting about this plant is it's pollinated by flesh flies or carrion flies. You can note that the flower on this is flesh colored and also smells terrible. So that will allow the carrion flies to uh, be attracted to it they'll land on the pollen, they'll realize, hey, this isn't meat, and they'll fly away, only to be uh, duped by the same trick later on down the line by another pop. Uh, this is also the host plant of the endangered uh, zebra swallowtail. So if you know where a pawpaw is in central Iowa, chances are you will also see zebra swallowtails. And the last one that I'm gonna talk about is another one that's blooming around now. So this is Jerusalem artichoke. Uh, it's also called sunchoke or sunroot or earth apple. Uh, it's a tuber or a root vegetable. Uh, this is found again really commonly in most prairies and roadsides. Chances are if you go along any road on, uh, in a more rural area, you will probably find this plant. The tubers are edible. Uh, you can eat them raw, you can eat them cooked, roasted, boiled, mashed, whatever you want. I would describe it as a taste between artichoke, potato, and carrot. Uh, regardless of if you cook it or not. If you don't cook it, it, it is a little mealy and starchy, but it's still perfectly edible. Again, this is specifically pollinated by bees. Uh, there is a type of bee called the sunflower bee, which loves this type of stuff because it is a sunflower species. And it's also the host plant for gorgon checker spots, silvery checker spots, and painted leaves. And with that, I will take any questions. Uh, we also have a couple of events coming up. Uh, just going through these really quick. 
Uh, on the 30th of September, we have a presentation by Chad Pogracki, who is the author of From the Bottom Up, One Man's Crusade to Clean America's River. This is going to be at Ames City Auditorium from 6.30 to 8. Uh, so feel free to stop on by, it's free admission. On the 1st of October, we have the Wild and Scenic Film Festival. Tickets are $20 per attendee. Again, this will also be at the Ames City Auditorium between 6.30 and 10 p.m. There will be six documentaries featured, a special presentation by an ecologist uh, with the USDA who's been restoring a prairie uh, south of Williamsburg here in Iowa. Food and drink catered by Wheatsville Co-op. And we will also have displays and a silent auction. And finally, we have our river and stream cleanup. Again, a free event, but you need to register online at our events page, which is prrcd.org slash events. Um, there's a participation limit of 40, just so we don't have too many cooks in the kitchen in the river. Uh, this runs from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. And we're going to be cleaning up a river by pulling out trash and gunk and making sure that it looks nice and uh, is healthy for people to enjoy. But now we'll take any questions. Uh, again, this is my contact info. We have social media all across all platforms and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. A few uh, comments in the chat um, that uh, bee balm is also a great uh, medicinal plant. Yep, um, so that's a, that's a good point. It is a great medicinal plant. Uh, since it's in the mint family, uh, indigenous islands used it like we use mint. They made teas out of it. They made uh, cold treatments out of it. They sweetened it with maple syrup and made sure that people drank it to clear their throats and clear up colds. It is a fantastic medicinal plant. Uh, Troy also recommended autumn olive berries as an invasive plant that is uh, edible. Yes, autumn olive is a, is a very invasive plant. So any way that you get rid of it is perfect. Um, Cynthia asked about uh, uh, sunchokes, has bought them at Wheatsfield. Um, mm -hmm. Again, wondering where they can be found. And I guess the issue there would be you'd need to remove the entire plant. And so probably not one to. Yep. So sunchoke, uh, again, this is where you're going to have to practice ethical foraging. These are extremely common. So picking out a couple won't be too much of an issue. Um, however, you might want to keep an eye on where they're being foraged from. If it's right next to a farm field, you might have some manure runoff or some fertilizer runoff that might be a little nasty, so you might want to clean them especially well. Um, but you can usually find them in most prairies and roadsides, um, and they usually grow through underground stems or tubers. So if you find one, your chances are you're going to find a whole bunch of them in a big patch or a big thicket. Um, so as long as you don't remove the entire thicket and as long as you keep uh, ethically foraging, they should be fine to pick. Um, but they are found all throughout our prairies and all throughout roadsides. They're extremely common. Um, question about mushrooms. Yeah, I am, uh, mushrooms. Not, I am not an expert on mushrooms. Um, I usually stick to plants, but we do have several species of edible mushrooms here in Iowa. Uh, I've seen a lot of people picking puffballs this time of year. Uh, they've been getting very large. I'm going to take a picture of my puffball that I found the other day. <laughs> yep. So puffballs, a... they are growing right now. So if you, you find one, they are, <laughs> they are perfectly <laughs> edible. They are a great natural source of protein. Um, but they are out this, uh, this time of year. Morels come out earlier in spring um, and early summer. Uh, they're usually going to be in wetter areas, and it's usually... People usually like to keep their areas where they source them from a closely guarded secret. So that's going to be up to you to go out into the woods and find them. Um, and there are also other species that are edible uh, that like to grow on trees, but I am not comfortable enough to recommend. Them. So uh, pop balls and morels are the ones that I know pretty well. Are there any other questions? I think that's everything in the chat so far. Uh, some other foragers, uh, beginning foragers. Uh. Another one I found a lot of this year is the yellow uh, oyster. Yep, mushrooms. oyster mushrooms yeah. and hen of the woods, chicken of the yep. woods. Yep, Troy uh, just recommended that. Yep. I have again, not a hen of the woods, but I'm looking. Again, just be just be careful when you yep. when you 
pick mushrooms and make sure that you get them verified by uh, either a master gardener or a biologist or someone who studies mushrooms and they can help you out with that. Um, I'm more of a plant guy, so I can, I can recommend good plants, but I am not qualified to, uh, to give any advice on mushrooms. And what I introduced before about foraging is not the be all end all of Iowa edible plants. There are several more. These are just the ones that are common around our area. So uh, if you have any other questions and want to know more about foraging, feel free to reach out to me um, about what might be blooming at different times of the year. Um, otherwise, uh, if you have any other questions, let me know, or uh, thank you for joining. Um, I'm happy to follow up with anybody who wants more advice on planting for pollinators and how to help them out. Um, just feel free to let me know. Yeah, thank you, David and Dan. I really appreciate it. Some great information for us today.